Thank you very much. Look, uh, it is enterprise and career development is, is obviously a, a big subject because it affects all of us and it's a very wide ranging subject and obviously I've got a time constraint and, uh, and if I lapse into too many uh, statistics it could be a staying awake restraint as well, uh, especially with, since we've all had lunch. So um, I'd, all, I'd like to start by saying thank you to uh, Sarah uh, and Freddie for inviting me. It's a, it's a great pleasure uh, and an honour to, uh, to have this opportunity. And uh, at the risk of maybe hopping around a bit in my presentation, uh, bear with me because obviously I'm not going to be talking about necessarily how to start a business and run it. I, I thought perhaps for this, I had prepared a presentation and then when I got here I thought it's... it's and I have to say I was blown away with, uh, with some of your, your... or all actually of your... Your previous speakers, I thought, boy, these guys are going to be a pretty hard act to follow. Like I could, uh, I could be uh, uh, accused of possibly boring everybody to death with this, but uh, I, I hope I can uh, keep up with the quality. And uh, and and this is my my second trip to uh, to Joburg. The first being the the Media Tech Show. Now, last time I was here, I'd just come back from a uh, from working in India, and. You know, it's a it's an emerging market, and uh, uh, it's 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 pretty diverse, and, and there's a bit of everything. And uh, you know, India itself is is a is a very active place, but it's quite uh, chaotic as well. And I expected, you know, I didn't have high expectations uh, of uh, when I arrived, and uh, and I turned up at the media tech show, and I, I was totally and completely blown away. Now. I'm diverging already, but anyway, in Australia, we, we were having a situation where you know, we say, oh, yes, we're a sophisticated and we're a professional market and, you know, we invented digital recording and uh, and the Thiel and small parameters and the lake processor and all sorts of things. You know, we were pretty impressed with ourselves. But we, uh, in our wisdom, thought we should have six trade shows in a year, you see, and uh, which, of course, is thoroughly unsustainable in an industry of 22 million people, regardless of how big that industry is. So... Uh, I showed up at the media tech show, met a whole lot of people, was, was pretty uh, pretty knocked out. So as as luck would have it, see, we have an industry association in Australia you know, called ACETA. I know you've got an ACETA, but our ACETA, same name, um, different, you know, different um, kind of association. And uh, we were among, it at the time, talking about trade shows. And uh, when I got back, we have four... We have four uh, Four board meetings a year, and we limit the board meeting to an hour and a half because if, you, if you're going to make it longer than that, you're talking too much. So to try and keep everyone on the point, we have a big time limit. So I get there, and uh, the subject of trade shows comes up, and I said, OK, guys, have a look at this. I've just got back from Africa. And they go, oh, yeah, nice. Did you see any elephants? Yeah, well, yes, I did, a matter of fact. But look, have a look at this. The elephant is, in fact, the elephant in the room is the profound stupidity of the way we're running the industry in, in Australia. So I handed around my phone, which had all the pictures from the media tech, and, and it totally absorbed their attention. And Aussies, I've got to tell you, are not natural team players. And putting an association together is only... Um, it's next to root canal, or, uh, kind of, or, or pulling your own teeth out with a pair of pliers, especially getting these people to sit in a room together. And I've got to tell you, that they went through and we looked at it and said, look, you know, they have one every two years and look how organised it is and they have training and they have a little museum and uh, look how perfect, look at some of these stands. And I showed them stands of some of the companies and, and they, were, they, were, they were speechless. So that, that then, looking at that, completely unified them in their purpose to straighten the situation out. And in that two years, we've gone from six trade shows now to realistically, I think we'll end up with two a year, which is still probably one too many, maybe even two too many. But that change, I really have to uh, compliment you on the, the quality of your um, capacity to organise yourself as an industry here because it, it, it actually, I, I, I originally came here to, to change here but of course the first thing that happened is that you changed uh, where we came from. So anyway, I'll get on with it. The South African industry you know, has a great future. 
You know, we all know that. The trouble with a great future is it's not here yet. And uh, uh, in, we have to go and make it happen. We have to, 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 get, to get it here, you see. Uh, there is, in fact, always a possibility that the great future will, will not actually even arrive at all. So, really, the road to a great future is getting on and staying on the right road. It's about organisation. Uh, it's about people working together in agreement and you know, all that stuff that we all talk about but never do, particularly in Australia. So what I thought I'd do is, taking a kind of a big picture approach, I'd, one way you can get somewhere, whether you're starting a business or whether you're running an industry or, or, or maybe you want to, you've got a big company and you want to go into a new phase of operation or something, well, really, a good start is analysing the success, a successful market or a successful company. It's like that book, you know, the, the actions of successful people. What are they? And, and I refer to them as, as the successful actions. What are the successful actions? Now, from my very limited understanding here, I, I see that uh, you have a, a, an echelon of your industry that is highly sophisticated. Um, you've got the training, you've got, you know, like the fact that, uh, that Gearhouse run a training college, uh, that, that's great. I mean, in Australia, there's a company called Jans. Just there's no one from Australia here, so I can safely say they're the best production company in Australia. They're not the biggest, but they're they're the best. Uh, and they have had uh, in a market that was impossible to discipline. Uh, they were a, or are a very very disciplined company and ran training. And so, first thing I look at when I say successful actions, I see well. I'm hearing a lot of talk about training and about upskilling and making people able and organisations running running their own training. Now, a, a, as a little uh, scene where everybody's kind of got one, uh, Jans used to used to do it because they, they were doing a lot of production. There was a lot of different standards around and they thought, we thought, okay, someone turns up, we want them to have done our course because at least they know which way around our XLR connectors are wired, you see. So l little, little things like that. So... When, when I look here, I, the second part to the industry I can see here is we could call the underculture industry without putting too fine a point on it. It's that part of the industry that's coming from, um, let's say, underprivileged, underdeveloped, let's not cut too fine a point on it, let's call it Soweto or something, you know, that's uh, an area where you've had, where you've got energy and you've got cultural input. Uh, you, in fact, you've got a strong cultural influence. You've got a large population and a young demographic. Uh, lots of lots of vibe, lots of kind of uh, energy, lots of motivation, but no money, no roadmap, uh, no not much in the mentor, uh, you know, area. And uh, but but a, a, a music and an arts culture that's naturally there, but the fact is, as we would say in Australia, can it get off the island? Remembering that Australia is in fact just an island, it's a big island, but it's, you know, it's, a, it's still an island. And, and sometimes you can have an island in the middle of a continent, and getting off that island uh, is very difficult because there's a lot of forces that are going to keep you there, and half of those forces are actually the forces that are on the island. It's not that people are keeping you out, you're keeping yourself out by the mentality and the environment and what you've grown up with and what you've been led to believe, which is quite often not true. So anyway, if I was to look for parallels between the African industry and the Australian industry, I go, okay, you've got a, you've got a sophisticated section. When I look at the, uh, the let's say, the, the developing section, what it reminds me of, of the Australian industry when I started. Now, uh, I, I'm actually exceedingly old, and uh, when when I uh, when I started, uh, many many of the people who uh, who who started when I did are in fact no longer with us. And I will get to the point of safety and accidents on jobs and uh, and driving a truck after three days of no sleep and a lot of drugs and there's all that kind of thing, which which. Uh, obviously doesn't happen anymore, but it was uh, it was kind of a standard operating procedure in Australia in those days. And uh, so the question is, I go well. If I look at at the risk of boring the daylights out of you with the history of the history of Australia, I put on my Aussie accent for that. Uh, the question to me is, what are the parallels 
and what can be learnt. And you'll see what I mean as, as we get going. If I was to say, what's the difference between your industry and, and, and the one I come from? Well, there's lots of similarities, lots of differences. The big difference is time. Now, I, I love specs, uh, specification, uh, you know, specifications and, uh, and, and, uh, and statistics. Uh, because let's face it, the good manager manages on statistics, not on uh, opinion, you see. So the Australian industry, um, what is it? I've got written down here, $33 billion worth of uh, creative industry. That, uh, that doesn't count a whole lot of things. That doesn't count the, uh, you know, the function industry. It doesn't count the, the we have a, especially in Melbourne, we have a huge events industry. For some reason, they don't count that in this spec, but uh, you know we've got a Formula One. As you, you know, it's probably one here somewhere, and a and big horse race. There's all sorts of things, right? So there's there's a company called Harry the Hirer. He puts up tents and he does uh, you know the knives and forks and the tables. Well, he's got uh, I think 300 permanent staff, and uh, his uh, factory occupies 16 acres, almost in the middle of Melbourne. You know, we're talking about a billion dollar company. That's just that, that's just a rental company. So. He's got, uh, you know, hundreds of our speaker boxes too. But the, the, the point is, is that as a, as a, as a uh, uh, an industry develops, of course, you can have all these subsections that become enabled by, you know, all of these subsections need some audio. So they're not counted. They're not counted as a creative industry. And globally in Australia. Uh, and in Australia, the, the creative industries are growing in most cases at double the speed of the, the normal economy. Like if the economy is growing at 3%, well, uh, the creative industries are growing at, at 6%. And in some cases more. I know in India they're growing even faster than that. Especially they'll have surges. They'll have a, an intense period of creative activity, and you'll, you'll see some in a minute. I'll have in the further on. And wh where, where the amount of growth in the, in, the, in the industry will be absolutely massive. But there's a few things that have to happen before that, that will happen. The other thing is, of course, I mentioned an enabling technology. Now, it's like a wireless microphone. Well, you could say, how many wireless microphones sell in South Africa? Well, it'll be whatever it is. But then, how many events require a wireless microphone? Well, anybody who wants to talk, anybody who's on television. We have a, a you know, used to have a television program in, in Australia called The Voice. You know, it's one of those... Uh, you know, a karaoke contests for a television that's got uh, you know an orchestra and a couple of bands and and a bunch of pretentious, uh, opinionated jerks as as uh, as the, you know as the as the judges that sit there and make inflammatory comments and uh, it, it naturally uh, being at, at a aimed at a high intellectual level it rates like crazy you see and uh, we had a lot of problems with getting wireless mic frequencies uh, going and. So, uh, you know, we took a bunch of people from the government to The Voice because they couldn't understand why we needed mi wireless microphones. Well, there was something like 380 channels or whatever it was, I can't remember, of, you know, comms and wireless mics and, and uh, in-ear monitoring and stuff. So th that just would not be able to happen at that level without a wireless mic. So if we talk about an enabling technology, forgetting about the cultural stuff, and I'll get, get there later, just from what our industry makes possible to happen, just physically. It, it's a massive contribution to the economic life and development of the country. Now, a couple more specs, I mean, uh, uh, stats. Well, live performance, I'm in the PA companies and the light, lighting companies, 1.2 billion. Remembering that that's you know that it, I'm pulling these specs from uh, from Australia's ACETA, and they got them from the government. Um, as I said, it didn't include include corporate audio, which is you know pretty big. There's companies with hundreds of staff that just do that. Uh, the recording industry or broadcast, or you know, that's basically go and put up a PA. Uh, it, it also doesn't include the 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 technology product sales, which of course I do, and. There's lots of them. I mean, we've probably got 80 or 90 companies in Australia that make and export technology. Um, and the, but the, the, the key takeaway point here on this one is that out of that you know, 1.2 billion plus, 
a significant portion of that is not done by the big companies. It's actually done by the smaller enterprises. And if you add them all up, I'm talking a guy who's got a little rigging business of two people that hires himself off to staging connections or something. Uh, you may find that in, in 10 years' time, half of Gearhouse's staff might be contractors because the way the industry may move, that may be a much better model for them to run their business. So this is the thing, is that we're not talking about just pumping up the Zeppelins here. There's, there's also the... Uh, it, it goes right down the line, essentially. So you can say, well, uh, you know, what's this got to do with anything? Well, when I started, none of this existed. There was no industry of any, any significance. There was a few people hired out horns that they put up at, at, uh, at racetracks. And it went from, uh, from that to uh, an industry that is a major significant employer and force. It's, it, it's something like 7% of the Australian workforce is connected to our industry or enabled by our industry in some way. So, you know, it's pretty... So I figured the best way to look at this is to give you a quick history lesson on the Australian industry and then look at the parallels because let's run the tape back to, to the 60s. Right. See, in the 60s, Australia was the ultimate cultural backwater. Uh, it, it, just as, just as, as an island, it produced some strange animals. It also had a similar effect on the people as well, you see, and it was a really insulated, inward-looking country that, that had a massive cringe about itself, thought nothing was good enough, and that, that rampantly sought approval from anybody. What do you think about Australia? You know, that's the first thing they'd say when you got off the plane. I don't know, I'm jet lagged and I've, it takes so long to get here that I'm practically in a coma. You know? So that, that was a kind of mentality. And I won't even bother going down to the white Australia policy and all the other, you know, the complete, uh, it, it just goes on. But anyway, just, this, this is going to be an exercise in how fast something can change. Now, I'll start in 1969. In 1969, I was, you know, I think, 16 or something, 17, I can't remember now. Uh, have a, you have a little pictures there. This was a gig in 1969. You see a couple of column speakers in one. Uh, the other one was a, a, a famous Aussie pop star at the time called Normie Rowe. Uh, girls would swoon at the sight of him, you see, so how things have changed. But uh, the, uh, there, there is in a gig. This, you can't even see a sound system. It's probably a couple of horn speakers hanging over the stage. So if we talk primitive... You could let's let's remove for ent for the entire sophisticated uh, part of the South African industry. Let's go to the most impoverished uh, place that uh, you know section of the society, and say, well, what have you got? I need to do a gig. They would still have been ahead of us in uh, in, in 1969. You see. Now, moving along to 1972, uh, I was at that show. That was Led Zeppelin. When Led Zeppelin played in Australia, um, I think half the Australian industry that that that's of my age were at that show, and at that moment had the road to Damascus experience. That uh, no, they weren't going to work at the bank; they were going to do this, despite the protestations of their parents. Now, that was our, our, our first really big PA, and that was built in Australia from pictures that someone had seen uh, at the movie on Woodstock. So. Once they got the idea, they go, that's what we need. We need these big black boxes. And look at that guy with the long hair. Everyone had short hair in Australia in 1960. Look at that guy with the long hair. That looks cool. So big PAs and bad hair became, became the fashion. And as much as if, you, if someone said, what do you do for a living? I'm, I'm an audio engineer. What does that do? Do you, like, fix people's hearing or something? Do you? So, you know, it's a, and, of course, no one knew what an audio engineer was and, and most of the people that had any qualification were, you know, at university learning to be a dentist or something and then realised that girls weren't very interested in dentists but they love people hanging around in bands. So, so uh, that's my excuse anyway. So, consequently... That alone, if you look at that transition, 1969, that didn't exist, 1972, they had enough stuff to stage a, uh, a big act like that. Now, by 1974, here's another sound system. Now, now we move from the, uh, from the stadium. 
This is a gig. This is their first gig that they did at night because prior to that there wasn't any lights, you see, so you had to have your shows on during the day because, as you notice in that Led Zeppelin gig, there was, there was not even a piece of truss. They, I think they, we used to make our Par 64s out of coffee tins and then mount lights in them, you see. And uh, so, you know, if you, if you haven't got it, you make it, right? You get on with it. You, you're going to have it. You just have to do it yourself. So, so anyway, there's probably a few coffee tins still in that lighting grid. Now, looking at safety... But there's nothing holding that up practically. It would fall over at the slightest puff of wind. There's nothing holding that, that PA down. And, uh, but in those days, safety was considered to be something that girls thought about or that uh, you know, no, no manly roadie would, uh, would, would concern himself with uh, safety. And you'd prove it by injuring yourself. I broke my ankle three times in one year, which just got, you know, falling out, it fell out of the truck three times. So I'm not very balanced at the best of times. And... Twice I got hit by a rack, and of course in those days they were pretty heavy. I'll show you a picture of one in a minute. And, uh, and I mean, that's dumb. I mean, really, you'd think you'd learn at least the first time, but I'd managed to do it three times in the one year. People used to uh, w walk around seeing me in a, you know, in, a, in, a, in a plaster cast and go, gee, that must have been a bad break. I'd say, no, I broke it again. But, uh, OK. So 1974, we were building PA systems. There's, in fact, one of the offending culprits sitting right there in that uh, picture. And that's a picture of me putting a fallback wedge together just to prove I did have hair in 1974. But uh, so you know, we, we, there was no science at all, but we uh, we were pretty we were pretty motivated. So bearing in mind we've got 1969, nothing. 1974, uh, it's pretty rough, but it's 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 uh, it's it's there. So we've had a a, a massive change. Uh, at the time, we didn't really see it as change. We just needed some stuff, so we went and made it and, uh, and that was that because nobody said we couldn't, you see. So fortunately there was also a boom taking place because this didn't just fall out of the sky. What was happening in there was a pop boom. We had the, uh, the, you know, the pop industry and because it cost so much to get to Australia we had to create our own bands and uh, people would get a, you know, the record of you know, some American or some English band and, and we just, we basically created our own, at first we just copied them and then, and then we, we, you know, we, people started writing their own music and because it was just black and white television it was pretty boring. There was nothing else to do and, you know, if, if, if you weren't very good at surfing and you weren't very good at sport and you were fairly unattractive and probably had body odour problems, the, the best thing you could do was, was real, learn to play your instrument and there was nothing to watch on TV so you might as well practice. So in, in a relatively short time, we, we actually had a pretty good uh, band music scene of people who were writing great uh, songs and it was a, a culture that went out at the time. People wanted to, young people wanted to go out, that they, they wanted to go to venues, they wanted to hear bands, they wanted to have a good time and it, it actually created a kind of a pressure cooker. Re remember that nobody's got off the island yet. Nobody's even, it's become so interesting and so everyone's become so absorbed in it and it became such a competitive environment as far as all the bands were going. And of course, the bands, it became a contest of who could be the loudest. So then you needed to have the wall of doom sound system and uh, you know, you'd have the highly unroadworthy truck that you bought from the auction of all the trashed rental ones and you'd gaffer the, the tail lights back on and off you'd go, you see, and you'd, you'd be on a tour. And because there was so many gigs and there was so much opportunity to play, the skill level of the, the crews because in those days, if I say oh, I'm going to put a PA together and go and do a gig, you know, in, in a hire company these days, where you go to a, you know a, a place and you just open a, get all the cables and you go to another thing and you get all these racks and you just pack it in the truck and off you go. Well, when 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 we started, you'd get out there with hammers and nails and a stocking saw and you'd start there and you'd literally make a sound system. You know, the first mixing desk I had, I built and it blew up and then I made another one and that nearly electrocuted me and the third one kind of worked. So, you, you, And that was really common. That's what people, it wasn't special, that's what everybody did. And we all copied each other and someone would make something really good and we'd say, oh, can I hire your mixing desk? And you take it home and pull it to pieces and copy it and put it back and take it there, you see. So, and, and that's what would happen. Now, what it started to do, it, it also, because we started writing, you know, making up our own songs, uh, it, it started a bit of a cultural 
awakening where we were, they weren't interested in American music anymore. They weren't interested in European music. They didn't want to copy anybody. They thought it was a bit boring. Uh, you know, the, music, the English bands are a bit wussy. You know, the American bands will, you know, they all sounded like country music or something. So basically you started having this quite edgy rock music scene started, started, started to develop. So, and it got to a point where the pressure cooker was going to explode and people became so confident that they wanted the rest of the world to hear what they were doing. So essentially, but by the time you get to the end of the 70s, a few Aussie bands have gone overseas and crashed and burnt just big time because they, they had no management skill. Uh, they really had no idea. There was no market research. There was no thought that went into it. They just saved up a whole lot of money and, and off they went. And in most cases, were a were, were a flop. But one in a you know, like you had a band like the Seekers, which is this nice little folky act that that made you know nice family kind of music, which was very nice, and they sung very well. That one would get up, and then the next guy would come along with with an absolute. Uh, super loud rock band, and he'd get booked into, uh, you know, cl it's classic like if you ever saw Spinal Tap, like the hard rock band at the Air Force Base, like incompatibility plus. Well, there's a lot of that, but after a while they started to figure it out, you see. So by 1980, it started to become more organised. Uh, the safety aspect had become, in fact, less organised, but the bands themselves had, had become quite good, and there was accompanying that and dragged along with it were well, all these people who 10 years ago were building their own sound systems were now very accomplished and battle-hardened and had done, in, in some cases, a couple of thousand shows. And they might you might imagine a 23-year-old guy who's done several thousand shows and knows how to build a sound system with elementary tools. These people then started to tour internationally and encounter the real world. And that's when the networking started. Now, here's a picture of ACDC. They're, I'm told, you know, they're the, the, the greatest rock band in the world. Well, I remember seeing them at a pub in 1975 wearing shiny space suits as a teeny bopper band. And then they, they realised they had to go edgier and, and get the working class hero thing going because that was their demographic. And as soon as they had that and wrote edgier songs, off they went, and their, their first tour in America was just was just massive, you see. And really, what followed after that was an avalanche of them, because when you go to America, they go, well, that's great, son, but what else have you got, you know? So, they'd say, and, you know, manager would go over and say, well, I've got this chick called Kylie Minogue, and, you know, she does this dance act, and she, look, she was on television in Australia. Well, that's not going to carry much weight here. Yeah, but, you know, have a look at the dance act. Okay, well... What, what segment of the market can we position her in, you know? So, but they started to carry, get onto that. They realised that they had to treat these things as marketing exercises. And then once one would work, that would then uh, break the ground for others. And because it was new, a, a new sound that the Americans and the English hadn't heard, and the fad nature and the fashion nature of uh, those industries, it, it kind of caught on, like, man, you guys are great, you know, and, and you got any more, and and, and, it, and we had literally a, a truckload of them. Now, hold that thought for a minute. You've got a truckload of Aussie bands, new sound, uh, what else you got? And I'll, I'll hark back. In 1980, um, maybe it was late 79, I can't remember, in the fog of gig, uh, I was in America doing a, a, I was there for a couple of months doing a, a job. And I'd go around there and uh, first trip to America and people would say to me, uh, you've got a funny voice there, where are you from, son? And I'd say, I'm from Australia. And they'd go, Australia? Gee, you, you speak English really well. I'm going, oh, thank you. You know, I saw that movie. The movie? Yeah, you know, the one of the mountains and, you know, those girls and the Von Trapp singers. And I'm going, Sound of Music. Yeah, you know, that one in, in, in Germany or a place. I'm going... Oh, Austria. Oh, no, this is Australia. Why, wow, is that near Austria? Oh, okay, don't worry about it. It's all right. Thank, thank you. you know, thank you. And, and like, I absolutely did not have a clue. If I, it, I mean, realistically, they couldn't have found England on a map, but, the, but they had absolutely no chance. Here's a map of the world. Where's Australia? Oh, I don't know. You know? And uh, so, so they, the, the profile of Australia in America 
was zero. It wasn't much of a profile in Europe either. But once the Americans started, you know, copying an earful of this loud racket that we were exporting over to them, and it started to sell, the Aussie thing started to catch on a bit. They at least knew that Australia wasn't in, in Germany uh, then, it was somewhere else. So, so what, what, what happened was, is the, the interest, that, that what they loved, I, I, like I'd go into a bar and they just want to sit there. I went back a couple of years later and then they knew that, uh, you know, that Mad Max had been a the movie had been. They'd seen a few Aussie bands, you know, they'd, they'd seen Mad Max. They didn't know that was Australian. They dubbed it into American because they didn't think the Americans would understand the accent. So our first big movie export they thought was an American movie and they, they reversed the print so the cars would be on the other side of the road. So that, that's how confident they were in, in 1980. That's when that came out. That's how confident they were in an Australian product. They completely adulterated the movie and made it a B-grade American one. The second Mad Max movie was sold as an American movie. That was four years later. So that's the change. Now, this guy's Paul Hogan. He, uh, you probably never had them here. He was part of a, a, an advertising campaign to sell America. Uh, you know, tourists to come to Australia. He had this, he'd have this thing where he'd say, we're going to throw a shrimp on the barbie, you know, come over to Australia, sort of stuff. And... Uh, and that, you know, they made it look inviting and, and he'd have be surrounded in bikini-clad girls and, of course, uh, Americans arrived in droves after that. So, but from th then, the, he was actually a muso. He'd actually, I used to go and see him at a pub, you know, he, he, did, he did a music and comedy show. And, uh, and then he, they started this advertising campaign with him and then the Americans knew who he was. So then, then they came, he came out with a movie, they made a movie called Crocodile Dundee. Probably haven't seen it here, but it was, uh, it was a, a movie about a, uh, this, uh, this Aussie complete backwater guy who ends up in America and, uh, and, and, uh, and then she comes to, to Australia. Oh, that's right, she comes to Australia to interview him because he got bitten by a crocodile or something. It's like a novelty story and, and a whole thing gets going and they got two movies out of it because they made the second one with him in New York. Now, in America... If you say that, you know, the crocodile guy, that, they all know who that is. Now, it was the ad that got him the profile and it was the music industry connection that got him the ad. Now, after that was successful, we had Mad Max 2 and Mulan. There was just any... There was a whole stack of the same thing happened again. It followed the model of the Australian rock band music industry almost to a T, where one broke it for the rest of them. But people didn't, you know, in America didn't realise. We'd been making movies in Australia for years, but they were kind of art house movies made on low budget that were, were well critically reviewed, but nobody actually went to see them, you see. But once the vibe was there, then the budget was there, because it all gets back to return on investment in some of these industries. And, and once they realised they were going to make money and here was the new fad... Uh, off it went. And of course, there's lots of movies that the Aussies made that in, in America and Europe that aren't even known as Australian movies. A lot of people don't know that Moulin Rouge was made in, in, in Sydney. So th there's, there's all these, there's a whole scene that, that, that flew on from that, that Aussie music industry scene. Now, apart from all the economic activity that was generated, what happened was there was a, a terrific cultural boost. Because remember when I said in the 60s, Australia was this drab, boring place where nothing was good enough and everyone was ready to apologise for, for being an Aussie? Well, now, uh, the, the next thing, uh, of course, you know, 1982, we beat the Americans in the American Cup, first country to do that. Uh, we, we'd had you know, some movie success, we'd had some band success, then we went over and clobbered the Americans uh, at their own gailing, sailing game where they wrote the rules and just continue to write rules until they won. And, and of course, the Aussies just continuously contested them and contested them. They kept getting disqualified. And, and in the end, it was a six-race series. They were five races down. The Americans had won, uh, I think it was... No, four races down, the Americans won... Had, uh, well, I forget how it was. Anyway, we were, we were in, only in a position where we could only win if we won every race from here on out, and they did. And they beat the Americans by something like 100 metres. Fought all the way, you see. It was fantastic television. It was probably 
boring sitting on the beach watching it, but the thing was, what had happened was now the country had developed a great sense of confidence in itself and it was a great boost. And what it meant, and once again, remember that the, the music industry and dare I say the audio industry was the linchpin in this whole thing because one thing led to another. Now it was considered that Aussie culture was now selling in the, around the rest of the world. It was, it was really becoming kind of, it, it was like a brand now. Australia was no longer a country that, you know, weren't, weren't you that had that, you know, singing group with the, you know, in the mountains. It was now a brand and everybody knew what the brand was. They might not have owned anything about Australia, but if you said it, it meant something to them and there was a fair chance they would buy it, you see. So fast forward, 2015, we now have uh, an entertainment technology industry that is, uh, you know, we, we, the Olympics since... 2000, around the world have been done by an Aussie rental company. In fact, most big games are done by Aussie companies. It's a thing we've developed an expertise in. Uh, in terms of our manufacturing, uh, it's one of the fastest... It, it's always been a good industry, but it's, it's, it's a massively in, increasing industry in terms of our export of technology. Once again, there's a lot of stuff... There is, in fact, no concert sound system in the world that doesn't have something in it that was invented in Australia. Not just made in Australia, but the technology and the engineering was invented in Australia. Now, that wouldn't have happened unless we'd had that kind of uh, music industry kick along and, and that revenue stream that made that all possible, you see. Okay, so what's it got to do with South Africa? Good, good question. It has everything to do with South Africa. The fact of the matter is, and I'm not, uh, you know, blowing up your balloon here, but this could be South Africa in 10 years. There is, from where I'm standing, uh, there is no reason why in 10 years' time South Africa, uh, because um, I, when I say South Africa, I mean Africa generally, but there always has to be um, a pointy end of, of any attack. There's the shock troops. There's the, there's the people who go, we can do this. And then they go and occupy the enemy trenches. Now, someone has to start. And realistically, from the, the, my limited experience, uh, you guys are standing at the front of the queue and, and it really it, it is your responsibility to do this, basically. And basically, the other thing is, if you want to be there in 10 years, we, we've talked about working together... It's like, you know, in Australia we say, oh, yes, you know, our company will say uh, our most important resource is our, you know, most important resource is, our, uh, is our people and they go and fire half of them, you see. Well, uh, it, it has to actually be genuine. And when it comes to the working together, I'll get to the trick for doing that. And believe me, getting Aussies to work together is the ultimate in herding cats, but it, it can be done. Now, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to run down some take-home messages from Australia that I think may resonate with you. The Australian industry was not created by the rich, it was created by the working class. Now, uh, I, I, personally, my background, I came from Melbourne's most expensive school, I came from a quite well-off family, but everybody else I know got into the industry because it was either work at the lead smelter or join a band or, or carry the boxes and, and, and get the truck. And uh, the, the fact is that when you've got uh, an environment of people who are limited in their opportunities, there's kind of nowhere else for them to go. And if they've got a capacity and an aptitude to do it, they will do it. And, and in Australia, uh, all of those bands, that when you hear any of them talk, they weren't terribly articulate because half of them had hardly been to school. If they'd had any money or if they'd had any opportunities, they simply wouldn't have been doing it because, and especially the, the audio industry that I was in at the time I came through, it was really tough. It was violent, it was aggressive, it was full of, you know, I used to call them nature's walking wounded and the other half could be described as oxygen banded. So people who had, in many cases, serious social attitudes that, that realistically, it was their opportunity to take revenge on the rest of mankind. So... And, and, and the industry was run by the most shonkiest bunch of crooks you've ever seen in your entire life. And 
But that because they're all kind of unified in purpose, the greatest crime in, is the show isn't going on. So the show is not going to go on, was, was not even in anybody's vocabulary. You did whatever you had to do and anything in the way got moved by whatever means you had to do it. So it was a tough, difficult, under-resourced industry of people who were on a, a, a kamikaze trip, basically. And the people who had it easy, they weren't going to do that. They're just going to go and work in daddy's business. Now, really, what the industry was carried by were the eccentrics and the outsiders were the creative and imaginative force in the industry. Pardon me if I, they say don't read, don't read your slides. Excuse me for reading my own slide, but it says, it's like the, the industry made the best of what it had and may do rather than complain about the lack of resources and give up. It was the pop culture and the energy from the least resourced part of the community that made it work because they were resourceful and self-reliant. The truth is they had nothing else. They had to make this work. Learning to get the most from the least means that you will, when you do finally get some resources, you're going to be less likely to blow it because what you've got you paid for in blood. Now, we're talking about you know, little enterprises. You don't need a lot of money to start a business, but you do need to know what you're doing. And in fact, you can start, you know, you can really start with nothing if you've got everything up here. If you've got a plan, you've got a network, and the network is, the network, if you deliver to the network, the network delivereth to you. You know, we'll maybe talk a bit about that down here. The, the, the fact is, is that you do not need, as, as much as we're all going to, and I do this back at the association, put my hand out for the government and write, you know, chapter and verse and unroll the Dead Sea Scrolls about why they should give us some more money. Uh, but realistically, to get to that point, you have to demonstrate competence because the governments have had a lot of experience at you know, handing out money, having a great photo op, which is what you have to have if you're going to get money. Uh, the better the photo op, the more money. But uh, unless you can follow up, unless you can deliver a return to the government, you're only going to get it once. So in Australia, looking at successful actions, back in the old days, the government neither helped nor hindered us. We were kind of an embarrassment. If they ignored us, we'd go away. The best thing they could have done was ignore us because at least we weren't hindered. Now, OK, we weren't hindered with safety regulations. We weren't hindered with drink driving laws. Uh, we weren't hindered with all sorts of things that I have to say were uh, you know, not a, not a, a great uh, thing. Uh, ideally, you want to mature to a point where some of those restraints on bad behaviour and dangerous behaviour uh, become imposed. But realistically, we weren't impeded. Now, when the industry started to mature, uh, we, as I said, you know, herding the cats, the cats were finally, by a set of circumstances, forced into an association. Now, how that happened was another complete saga on its own. Uh, the fact is, is that we, we, we should have done it early, but instead we, we did it, we were relatively late. Another success, and mind you, the fact that we have now done it has been the industry that we believe we need to become because, to be honest with you, it's, it started off like a pirate ship and now it's just a more professional pirate ship. And it, it does, you know, the Australian, in many ways, the stuff that I've heard here, I'd love to have these guys at an at a event in Australia because I've got to tell you it's, it was a revelation to me. For a while there I thought we were getting on, on the ball, like we're just pathetic after I, especially Randall. I mean, I, I, I don't even know if I want to bring Randall to Australia. They might put a pillow over his head. But the, the thing is, though, is, is that uh, Andy, yes, we'll start with Andy and then work our way up to Randall. But the point is, if you've got an association, join it and support it. Now, the worry with associations when we go back to the cat herd, they're all afraid that someone's going to dominate it and someone's going to influence it and whatever. And I say, well, guys, just show up. You know, join and come on the board. I said, you know, there's two board, board spaces left. Uh, you can't... Like in Australia, we have compulsory voting. 
And people go, oh, you know, that's horrendous. Why would you have compulsory voting in a democracy? Well, it was popularly voted. 98% of Australians voted for compulsory voting. Now, by compulsory voting, I don't mean you have to vote. You have to show up at the polling booth and have your name crossed off. Now, if you want to throw the, the ballot ticket in the bin, fine, you've arrived. As a citizen and as part of the Australia and as part of the, the uh, sacrifices that people have made before you, you've got to show up. So it's the way I look at it. Association, show up or shut up, basically. So, so we've got our little, uh, you know, a seater. Um, as uh, as uh, uh, Kevin was explaining probably earlier, governments don't want to talk to individuals. And in fact, really, the governments don't really want to talk to anybody because they're just going to complain. So, and, and if you put yourself in their position for a moment, they're in an impossible position because they've got their own herd of cats to preside over and every interest will have a conflicting interest. So to go to, to, go to a government with problems and think they're going to help you, forget it. It's not, it's not going to happen. You've got to go to them with a situation. OK, you know, Minister for this, that and the other thing, here's our situation. Um, this is the, going to be the outcome of that situation. This is what we believe needs to be done. This is what the industry believes needs to be done. Are you OK with this? And when can we start? This is what we need. This is our gradient to get into it. We're not going to try and knock it off all in one hit. These are the milestones that we're aiming at and the time and our uh, the evidence of demonstration of our fulfilment of those milestones. You go to them like that, you, you'll start, you know, they'll pull out the checkbook, you see. At your leisure, I mean, maybe have a look, aceta.org.au, um, you know, Freddie will have the details on this. Have a look on the website. Now, we are not a full-time organisation. We're basically, you know, a bunch of amateurs, really. We do have a professional secretariat that our fees pay for. But you'll see what we're trying to do is uh, we have a standards thing. If you join the association, you sign up to the standards, which means you become a, a compliant organisation passing probity in a whole stack of areas. Which means no point going to the government asking them to talk to you if you can't prove demonstrably that you are compliant to the, all the government legislation. Are they going to back you if you're going to you know, drop a stage on someone's head? Well, the answer is no. You're going to embarrass them. They're never going to give you another dollar again. So this gets back to the point of the three-way partnership. In Australia now, and I wish we'd had this 20 years ago, we have the market in all of its forms. We have the government and we have a seat as represented now as the peak body. Now, we're not so pretentious as to call ourselves the peak body and that we're going to rule by decree and fiat. Uh, we talk to all of the other associations and we're trying to create links with overseas associations in the hope that we might get a bit more professional about what we're doing. But you, you, you treat them as partners and, in fact, the market is a partner as well, because ultimately, even if you're running a business, you have to have a business that is creating good outcomes for your customer base, otherwise you are a parasite. And we all know what happens to parasites in the ecosystem. Eventually, uh, they, they, they either become a dinosaur or, or the, they get eradicated by, uh, by the system. Now, the take home message for this one is a healthy industry is an ecosystem with players of all sizes and skill levels. So any action that you do that benefits and grows and fosters and improves the quality of the ecosystem is going to help you. So even when you've got a room full of you know, people on a board or in an association that are all trying to kill each other during the day, uh, at night they're fixing this guy's problem this week because next week they'll be fixing your problem. And you have to have the fully functioning ecosystem with big players and small players. The small players aren't going to try and knock off the big players and the big players can't stand on the small players because the small players are doing all the jobs that the big players, that it's not economic for them. Uh, and the small players are often the ones with a lot of energy. So what the big players have to do is create an ecosystem that has the right kind of small players. So the Industry Association is the defender of the ecosystem.
The government can be effectively engaged by, by provide, providing targeted assistance with the help and support of the industry stakeholders through the peak body. Now, getting back to, say, little problems that, that, that come up in an industry, we talked about, say, standards. One of those, we, we had a problem in Australia of uh, people importing fake PAs. Now, knockoffs from China, all, all that kind of thing. Now, OK, the, ru the, the, the rules are if you, uh, say you import a fake Nexo box that's got Nexo written on it, you know, so, and I've seen fakes of this with Nexo written on it. You do that, you can go to jail. If that's got, uh, you know, if that's coming from the Skyfall Scaffold Company or maybe the, you know, the Bonfire Amplifier Company or something, uh, they can sell it. Um, so uh, people were starting to do that. And what would happen is they would be purchased by people who had no certificate for anything. Uh, you know, the trussing is from the Twisty Trusts uh, China Dragon Company. Uh, there, there, there's n nobody's got uh, a certificate in anything. The, the competent, uh, licensed, compliant, educated company, you're going to do a festival, that, you know, it's 12 grand. Uh, you, you know, uh, uh, Megadeth Incorporated uh, comes along and does it for $3,000. And the council goes, oh, well, you know, that, that's a big price difference, uh, Mr. $12,000, rigging company. Uh, uh, we, 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 uh, we're going to have to uh, readjust this. And, and if the $3,000 company doesn't get it, then the $12,000 company gets reduced to $6,000 to be competitive. And he's doing the job for nothing. In actual fact, he's going backwards. And uh, so then Mr. $3,000 company goes around. He is a complete destructive influence on the industry. Now... We had to somehow put a stop to that. But so long as they didn't call it a JBL box or an XO box or a whatever, uh, we couldn't stop them. Now, we tried ringing up all the insurance companies and saying, did you know that you're at these events having non-compliant, unspec qualified rigging and this, that and the other thing and breaking every rule in the book? It was, they didn't like it, but they, they seemed to be incapable to get their head around it. In other words... People had to die before anything was going to happen. And we thought that is just unacceptable because, like all these things, it's a bad name for the whole industry. And if we're hitting them up for money, dead bodies is a bad look, you see. So we, we thought we had to come up with another kind of approach. So we thought, OK, rather than making it, um, trying to make it illegal, let's make it uncool. So you don't need a lot of money to do this. We just started a Facebook page called Knock Off Entertainment. And it became, uh, and, and when you want to have a standards thing and you want to demonstrate competence, it's amazing how fast you get a whole lot of competence groupies hop onto the bandwagon who like become the new competence police, you see. So we start, we put on the website, we put up some dodgy, shonky looking gigs and everyone would write, people would, roadies would join and they'd go, oh, that's nothing, I saw a go, you know. And they'd start sending in pictures and, and we'd find all the fakes and, and who's doing it. And it became, through kind of an underground network, who the notorious culprits were and who to avoid. And, uh, and, and then it, it became a little scene that other people got swept up in. And over the period of a year, it pretty much stopped. Now, this gets back to this point of lateral thinking. Now, if we hadn't had an industry association, it actually cost us nothing. It, one of the guys put up a Facebook page and all their friends just sent in pictures and, the, and it went on from there. And then it started to become a thing people talked about. Councils started talking about it. People would turn up to, with a quote. They'd say, yes, well, can I see your insurance and can I see your, your rigging qualifications? And, and, and that pretty much stopped it. So... Now, the, the, the companies that benefited that were the higher-end companies, but the people who, who created it, who actually created that environment, were the individual traders that basically got onto it. So this is where a whole industry can help itself and why you need this diverse diversity in the industry. So we get back to this point that an association can raise standards and, as a result, Gradually, the, 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 the players can bring into the, the, the industry, we get rid of the, the players that could bring the industry into disrepute. Uh, this, you know, the education becomes more possible. There's a whole lot of other, other stuff that happens. So as we are now becoming an, an industry that's, tradition, uh, uh, that's transitioning into the industry that we should be, 
that, you know, the, the, the industry association was, was a very important thing. Now, I'll get off. Obviously, we're, uh, you know, time's running out. The last message I'll, I'll say, really, I haven't had a chance really to talk much about uh, career development, but these are a couple of points that apply to individuals, groups, companies, and, and really are the, are the key to, to success. And there's something for you to, to think about maybe in the midst of what, what, when I see the, the difficulties that you've got with the, the transformation and the other things, I mean, I boggle at the, the size of the problem here. Uh, and it's not like you're, you're sitting there with uh, nothing in the past to deal with and, and a big bag of resources to deal with it. So uh, it, it's, it's a serious taxing and, and, and substantial Everest that you're going to be climbing. If someone was starting in the industry, what, what, what would I say to them? I'd say don't let anybody tell you what you can be, do or have. You Really, you don't know what you can be, do and have till you, till you start. But the person... I think my successful action has been to arrive, really. The person who can arrive is a good start. The person who can arrive, arrive and arrive again and keep arriving with an unshakable intention to succeed for himself and those who are counting on him. It's not just about you. It's about what you can bring. That person, that, that is the person that will succeed. Success is really the overcoming of known barriers to achieve known goals. Well, to pull that off, you've got to know what the barriers are. You've got to make yourself able. You don't tackle the biggest problem first. You tackle what you can tackle first. And you build a foundation of competence uh, and then armed with the right attitude and if you can stay focused. And, of course, you have to be able to keep going regardless of how hard it is. This business runs like a sine wave, except the sine wave goes like this. You'll have periods when it's going up, and you'll have periods when you're going down. Realistically, bad luck arrives for free, and good luck costs. You have to work for good luck. There's one, uh, there is an African who's done this. It took him a lifetime. He won in the end. I think it's... Uh, w with what you've got to deal with, you have the role models here. So it's a case of don't be stopped. Keep going. Make yourself able and you will do it. Thank you.